Mr. District Attorney, how are you? And everyone else here? Appreciate you coming. Um, we have your written testimony. Again, we're running a little behind schedule, so if you could summarize whatever you'd like to do. And I know we have questions here, so thank you. First of all, um, <clears throat> please identify yourself first. Yes, thank I you. Will. First of all, my name is Larry Krasner. I'm the District Attorney for the City and County of Philadelphia. Uh, seated to my left and my right, are my two first assistants, who are the Honorable Carolyn Angle Temin and also Robert Listenby. I would also like to point out that Keith Davidson, who is our Chief Financial Officer, Arun Prabhakaran, who is our Chief of Staff, Mike Lee, our Supervisor of Government Affairs, Cecilia Madden, Assistant Director of Administration, Ben Waxman, Director of Communications, are also here with us. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to give my thanks to City Council, to the First Judicial District, to Mayor Kenny to the entire staff of the DA's office, including those associated with our Crime Victims Advisory Commission and our CARES program, which provides advocacy for the families of victims of homicide. Also, I'd like to give thanks to other stakeholders and the public defender, Keir Bradford Gray, who may or may not be here right now. Um, and on her behalf, I just want to say three things quickly. Number one, we have had a very constructive relationship the district attorney and the public defender in Philadelphia. In some ways and at some times, we've been able to work hand in hand. The public defender is able to obtain information from their clients that we need in order to do our job properly. And they are also connected to the community in certain ways that the district attorney's office cannot be. And therefore, the fact that there is synergy and there is cooperation between the two offices has had tremendous benefits. Second, I'd like to point out we are very supportive of the public defender's efforts at changing pre-trial at overhauling it, and we are supportive of their efforts to try to have services in place so that when people are not in custody, there is something to do other than simply have them out. And third, I want to point out that for the second straight year, um, we are in support of parity. Parity is sometimes difficult to, to define, but the bottom line is what they do and what we do go in the same direction, which is towards individual justice, and that means that they need adequate resources, and we support them in that regard. We would also like to point out that getting cheap with the public defender's office is a pretty good way to get expensive with incarceration, and that just is just bad policy all around. Our presentation uh, includes a total of 65 slides and a video of about 20 seconds. I know you'll be relieved to hear it's only 20 seconds. Council I like that 20 seconds part. Yeah, that sounded good. Uh, and the 65 slides are not a minute apiece, although they sure, certainly could be with our hour allotted. <laughs> but I promise we will proceed expeditiously uh, to point out, first of all, our summary, but then to get into answering all the questions that this august body may have. So I see our slides are being set up. Are we ready? OK. And am I in control? Am I in complete control here? <laughs> As it turns out, I am. All right. OK. So uh, just we hope you are anyway. Yeah. We can only try. NASA is in control. I'm just trying. But um, first and foremost, I want to make sure everybody knows what the Philadelphia Police Department statistics on crime say about last year, because there seems to be a lot of political capital in saying things that aren't true. Point one, if you look at the bottom right on the Philadelphia Police Department statistics for crime in Philadelphia last year, you will see zero percent. And what that means is that there was crime was flat. There was no increase in crime in the year 2018. If you look at the blue line, which is at the top, that would be the summary of what happened for violent crime overall. And what you will see is a negative 5%. Whatever you may be hearing from people who are not that interested in science, here's the science. Violent crime overall went down in the city of Philadelphia 5% last year. Crime overall was flat last year. And I say that because it frames our discussion around policies. These are not my statistics. These are the statistics from the Philadelphia 
uh, police department. Yes, of course, we have a terrible issue around shootings. Yes, of course, we have a terrible issue around homicides. This is what keeps the police commissioner and me, and I'm sure all of you, up at night. And it is a very, very major concern, a discussion I've had with him many times. But we also know, and the commissioner agrees with me on this, that the increase in homicides that we are seeing, and very likely the increase in shootings, appears to be related directly to the uh, opioid crisis. And I say that because the police department's own statistics say that the one category of homicide that, that shot through the roof was drug-related, which went from 60 the year prior to 120 last year. Now, having said that, there are a few maps I want to show you, and I want to show them to you for a reason. Uh, because I think they tell the story and they tell the significance of what this administration and this city are trying to do together. If we look at the change in violent crime in 2018 by zip code, what we see is that it went down in 33 zip codes, it was level in three, and it went up in 12 zip codes. That does not make it okay. It is not okay for violent crime to be going up anywhere. That is not what we want. But the story here is where. Now let us look at another factor. This would be poverty in Philadelphia. Does it look familiar? You are seeing the same zip codes. And this slide will show you unemployment in Philadelphia. Does that look familiar? You are seeing the same zip codes. And this slide will show you education. And what I mean by that specifically is the level of attainment of a high school education. And once again, you are seeing essentially the same map over and over and over. The time to tell a simplistic story about how bad people just commit crime, and it's got nothing to do with education, it's got nothing to do with poverty, that time is over. The reality is that what we are talking about here is a systemic problem. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, I'm telling you exactly what you already know. We have a systemic problem, and we cannot arrest our way out of it. Yes, handcuffs are part of what we have to do. It is part of running the store. But the reality is that unless we are gonna, in the short term, do the things to fundamentally change the systemic problem in the long term because, yes, it's going to take a minute to get this done, then we're not going to do anything except get politicians elected and watch them fail. Our most important achievement, in my opinion, last year was our efforts at culture change. And culture change comes in many forms, but one of the most important forms it comes in is the, uh, is inclusion and is diversity of the absolutely most talented candidates who are out there to work in the office. We made that an extremely high priority because, to be very honest with you, I came into an office that, as some of you may recall, I graded as a B last year. And I got a lot of heat for saying in front of members of my own office that the office was a B. But I had to do it because it was true. And we have made every effort since then to bring up to improve and to change the culture within the office. We realize, I realize, that the work that we are trying to do is not gonna be done before I am gone, by whatever means. But we understand that the people who are gonna finish this mission and this arc of changing criminal justice are the people we are hiring today. And so we've made a real point of trying to do everything we can to hire the brightest and the best from Philadelphia and everywhere else. This was the situation at the time we came into the office, into office. On the left, you will see that before our administration started on January the 1st of 2018, the level of diversity in the entire office was at 30%. If you look to the right and you see the gray and purple circle, you'll see that that level is up to 40% in one year, a considerable increase. If you look at the second from the left circle, which is just ADA, so in other words, just attorneys, they were, the diversity level was 20% when we came in. As of right now, the diversity level is at 28%, but that is not the end of the issue. We figured out a strategy, and it was frankly unheard of in the DA's office, to try to go after the, the most talented Philadelphians wherever they may be. And yes, many, many of them are in the law schools in Philadelphia, but many, many of them are in other law schools all around the country. And frankly, we're really okay with bringing people who are not yet Philadelphians to become Philadelphians, because in our view, this is a world-class city, and this should be a national-class district attorney's office. And so we went to 29 different law schools. And when I say we went, I mean I went, I mean Bob Listenby went, I mean Judge Temin went, to 29 different law schools, including Philadelphia area around the country. And this is our entering class, which will be here in September 
of 2018. The prior year's class was hired by the prior administration, and so this is the class that is the most reflective. Yes, we went to the West Coast, we went to Texas, we went throughout the South, we went up and down the East Coast, and we went to the Midwest because that is where we could find all the talent we wanted. We specifically went to historically black university law schools with our six. We got to five of them, the sixth we'll get to this year, and we also went to a variety of schools, but among them, were top 20 rated schools in addition to the Philadelphia schools. Those are the faces of the many, many, many people who applied. We had more than 1,000 applications, and we ended up hiring a class of 62. That is not the picture of diversity that the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office is looking for, although that is the picture of diversity that you will find in a different prosecutor's office at Sixth and Market. This is the picture of diversity that we would like to see in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Do you see a difference? So, as it turns out, 24% of our incoming class are people who were either prior long-term residents of Philadelphia or are currently at Philadelphia area law schools. We also went, as I mentioned, to five of the six HBU law schools. Uh, and for those of you who may not know offhand, they include the former Antioch, which is the University of District of Columbia. It includes Howard University. It includes Southern University and the Thurgood Marshall School of Law, which is at Texas Southern University. We went to uh, North Carolina Central University, and the only one that we missed, and that was simply because they didn't seem ready to have us come, was uh, Florida A&M, and we will hopefully get there this year. So what does diversity look like for this entering class, which really is a reflection of our opportunity to bring in new people? Well, it is 55% diverse. I need to tell you, though, that we are adding to our diversity data some new factors. And those factors are uh, LGBTQI and also whether or not you are non-binary. If we separate out the LGBTQI and non-binary aspect, then the diversity level, meaning uh, predominantly racial and ethnic, is actually 49% rather than 55% because 6% of that total relates to the orientation um, factors that I mentioned. And if we look on the issue of gender, what we see is that is 45% male, 2% who identify as non-binary, and 53% who are female. That is unsurprising because uh, even before coming into office, there were slightly more women than men in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. This is Carla. Carla, I think, is an excellent example of what we found when we went looking. Carla Ogbiro is the proud, a proud graduate of Central High School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who grew up here. She is fluent in the Spanish language. Uh, she is also a citizen of at least two countries because she has a very interesting background with her two parents. And Carla is at Northwestern School of Law in Chicago, which is one of the finest law schools in the United States. At the time we got to Northwestern, she had already been offered and frankly, kind of sort of accepted a job in California. Why? Because Philadelphia wasn't chasing their own and wasn't coming to try to take some of their best and their brightest and make sure they don't just leave. Well, we went and we got Carla, and this is Carla. That's pretty cool, and that's Carla. She'll be with us in September. Let me give you one more example so you understand the human face of what we are talking about. Angela Brennan is a proud graduate undergrad of Howard University in Washington, D.C., and she is now completing her tenure at Howard University School of Law, where she's in the top third of her class. Angela Brennan wrote us a letter with her application, and I just want to read one paragraph of it, which is, excuse me one second. Being a black woman raised in southwest Philadelphia, I have witnessed injustice up close. Growing up in the Philadelphia public schools, I've witnessed brilliant kids give in to their surroundings and wind up behind bars for the rest of their youth. Throughout early adulthood, I've witnessed friends <clears throat> fall victim to crimes and never seek help because of lack of faith in the system. As an older sister, I've witnessed callous policies and treatment towards children with mental disabilities like autism. However, 
Since being in law school, I've learned the power of prosecutors and their ability to execute justice, whether that is by convicting bad guys or dropping charges. The chance to work with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office would grant me the opportunity to help make justice a reality and restore faith in the community that raised me. So that is what we are after. And frankly, I could not be prouder that that's what we have done in terms of diversity, inclusion, and bringing the best and the brightest to what we hope is a national class office in a world class city. In terms of achievements and in terms of reform that we have been after, this is a, this is a timeline of a few of the factors. We announced policies uh, bent on reducing mass incarceration, charging sentencing, and so on. In February of 18, we were only in office about 45 days, established a crime victims advisory committee composed of victims of crime to give us advice on what we can do to serve them better in the office in April of 18. Uh, in October of 18, we undertook to do various things to strengthen investigations, and most importantly, we were able to complete a very important prosecution of real drug dealers. And when I say real drug dealers, I mean professional drug dealers. I don't mean 18-year-old kids standing on a corner because they got no other opportunities. I mean this was a wiretap investigation in which we had months of wiretaps that were listened to following proper methods where we translated and we were able to determine sources of drugs, alternative sources of drugs. We were able to uproot an organization that had been on that block for 20 years whose ownership was in their second generation and that had done just fine until we got them with wiretaps. One of our budget requests is to double our capacity to do that because we can do more if we simply have more Spanish-speaking detectives and a couple more lawyers. In January of 19, we launched CARES. This, was, uh, this is a program, first of its kind in Philadelphia, that has 12 local representatives and a few people in charge for the purpose of providing advocates to the families of people who die in homicides. The idea is that they will essentially hold their hands through the entire process from the moment of learning of the, the death. Uh, obviously, we had to staff up, but it was done with a grant in an amount of a million and a half from our former Chief of Victim Witness Services, Movita Johnson Harrell, who has now moved on to another occupation, as many of you may know. And we consider it to be a major success in terms of our ability to assist those who are suffering through a homicide in their family. February of 19, uh, Robert Listonby led the way for our juvenile system reforms. We have also expanded AMP, which is the diversionary program for misdemeanors. We are working on evaluation of our bail reform. And yes, it turns out that our bail reform, dating back from February of 18, works. That's not just our opinion. That's the opinion of independent uh, others who studied it independently who said, number one, those who got released, which was over 1,700 under the new system, did not cause any increase in crime. And those who got released did not cause any increase in failing to appear to court. We also heard you when you told us over and over how important it was to fight house thefts and to fight stolen deeds, which has been a major priority for our office. And we were able to bring two significant prosecutions, one against a man who was released after 15 years for a sentence on a rape case and whose first activity was to steal six houses in a system that frankly needs more checks and balances so that won't happen. And then the other one more recently with another group of folks. We can do more. And one of our budget requests is simply for a few more attorneys and detectives so that we can do a lot more, in, not only in terms of actual prosecution of people stealing houses, but also in terms of trying to assist in policies that would change the policy so it's much harder to get away with it. We announced in March of 2019 policies that go to many of your questions on how we can limit the term of probation and parole. As you know, New York City has 12,000 people on probation and parole. Philadelphia has about 38,500, and we're a whole lot smaller. So there is a lot that can be done there. And in April of 2019, as you may know, we did a, an almost first of its kind prosecution of tow truck operators who were taking advantage of people who'd just been in car accidents and hitting them with bills of $1,500, $2,000 for what should have been a $200 towing of their car. Um, we have reduced future years of incarceration. And what that means is when a judge gives a sentence of 10 years, we're not going to necessarily be able to measure that just in the number of people in jail. We're going to be measuring that in five years and six years and 10 years. So we have reduced the number of future years of incarceration by nearly 2,000. We've reduced the number of future years of probation by over 5,000 years as compared to a comparable sample of prior administrations. 
We've increased the use of diversion by about 25%, and we've reduced the number of juveniles held in adult court by over 80%. There was some talk about reinvestment. There was some talk about cost savings. Well, there should be, because if you're going to spend all of your money on supervision and incarceration, then you're not going to have it for public schools, you're not going to have it for drug treatment, you're not going to have it for economic development, and you're not going to have it for the things that need to go in those zip codes that are chronically associated with all of those problems. This gives you not an example of what we are actually saving, because we are not going to see these savings right away. There are too many fixed costs. It takes a system a while to turn. But this is an example of the enormous, enormous potential for savings that can be reinvested into the things that build up community and prevent crime if we do what it is that many of you in council are suggesting, if you are careful about future contracts, if we are careful about where our resources goes. What you will see here is a comparison of the fourth quarter of 2018 versus the first quarter of 2014 in terms of how many years of future incarceration were generated in court. And the answer is 1,913 fewer years of future incarceration were generated. And if you start to work that out and use a rather conservative figure of about $42,000 per year as the cost of that incarceration, you're looking at 82 million bucks. In one quarter, in one quarter, multiply it by four and you get a year. That's $328 million. Multiply it by four years. You're up to $1.3 billion. Are you going to get all of it back? No, but you're going to get some of it back if you stop writing contracts. And I don't mean you personally, but if the city stops writing contracts that say we'll feed one person or 10,000 people for the same money, we'll provide health care for one person or 10,000 people for the same money, if we stop doing that and we actually put the money back where it belongs, we can move mountains. And yes, yes, we can go to the governor and we can say to the governor, this is how much money we're going to save you in the future. Maybe you don't need to build another jail. Maybe, especially in your second term, you need to invest in the city of Philadelphia because this money will be saved in the future. This is the cost of supervision. Supervision meaning both parole and probation, and the, the sources for these numbers, you can check with Mr. Hollander, but they do come from official sources. You're looking at $13.8 million saved in one quarter. Multiply that out. Where are you now? $56 million per year, four years, $224 million. Add that on to the, the prior savings, you're at a billion dollars. That is the significance, that is the impact. And no, you can't just measure it in how many people are in jail. That is the significant and that is the impact. Future years of probation is a, only a part of the prior slide, so we'll just skip over that. Um, now, I know I've gone on with my summary for a little bit because I get a little fired up over these issues. All right. Well, I appreciate that very much, Councilman. It's very kind of you. I hope Councilman Greenlee agrees, but I appreciate that. All, all def definition of take your time, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will, I will conclude quickly. So uh, as you all know, we had, a, we had a bail reform policy. That bail reform policy, when we look back at it a year later, approximately 1,750 people who were charged with nonviolent, low-level offenses that did not include sex offenses, it did not include possession of a weapon by a felon, and it did not include high-dollar, white-collar crime. When we look at that, what we see is 1,750 people who would have been stuck in jail weren't because of that policy, and there was no increase in FTA rate or recidivism rate. When we look at reducing mass incarceration as a goal of this city and a goal of this administration and a goal of many, many stakeholders who deserve a lot of credit for their efforts that have gone on for years before we ever got here, we see that the Philadelphia jail population reduced by 29% since January of 2018, which is roughly equal in percent to the percent change that happened in the prior six years. Um, obviously, this has been a team effort, but it is what happens when you have a, a prosecutor's office that is a willing partner, as opposed to being opposed to uh, what others, what other stakeholders are trying to do to reduce it. The population today, by the way, in the county jails is 4,500. And 90. We have also reduced barriers to diversion. We are, looking, we are looking to expand it greatly, and we are working with the FJD, in particular with the municipal court, the FJD, and Judge Dugan, to try to do just that. 
This gives you the graph, which indicates what I just spoke about, the actual multi-year reduction in county jail population. As you can see, the, the absolute numbers are not the same as percents. They never are. But I think the city should be duly proud of the fact that not so long ago, there were 9,505 who were in county jail, and we are now at 4,590, which is almost exactly half of that number. Deed theft, we did speak about this a little bit earlier, um, and obviously we are looking for a little bit of support. As it happens now, we're getting a ton of reports, but sometimes we cannot even respond with telephone calls that are gonna be an hour in length in order to try to get at the specifics. Sometimes we can't, can't even respond for several days simply because we need more capacity. Uh, I'm not talking crazy more capacity, but if we could take our two or three lawyers and make it four or five or six, there's a lot that we could do. Predatory business practices, we are, there are many different kinds. We'd like to get at a lot of them. Only one of them, which we have gone after, is, um, is the, tow, the tow truck business we're talking about. But there are a lot of elderly people in, in Philadelphia, a lot of seniors are getting ripped off by contractors. That kind of behavior is despicable. And we would love to have an economic crimes unit that is bolstered, that is beefed up, uh, under the supervision of uh, Judge Temin, by the way. We'd love to build it up so it truly protects working class uh, people and poor people from that kind of predatory behavior, and we will need some resources to do that. We, again, as I mentioned earlier, we had a very, very successful, um, a very, uh, successful collaboration with DEA and also with uh, with the Philadelphia police in terms of the Kip and Cambria investigation, about 67 people arrested. These were real drug dealers who uh, make their business at doing this, and they were distributing a lot of opioids at that location. If we can simply get some more resources, we would be able to double that. You should know that that kind of investigation, the wiretap investigation over a period of a few months, is something that the feds usually do, except the feds usually take years. And it's something that's very difficult for the Philadelphia police to do because it requires a lot of specific knowledge and education around conducting wiretaps, and it requires a lot of interaction with the DA's office. We are always ready to collaborate, but this is a role where our much, much smaller office, we are 600 people. The Philadelphia Police Department is approximately on the order of 6,800 people. This is an area where our smaller um, law enforcement entity can do a lot in terms of trying to pull up the whole dandelion instead of just, you know, yanking off the flower and a couple of leaves. And now I'd like to speak for a moment, if I may, about, the, about some of our efforts around victims, but also our efforts to really try to make sure that the system is accurate. We have recently been able, due to the excellent efforts of Anthony Voci uh, and a state trooper who worked with us, we've recently been able to solve and capture uh, the defendant in a 31-year-old homicide. This would be a man who was in the Carolinas, and in fact, he killed two people. And when he killed them in almost the identical way, and it took a long time to resolve, but we are willing to go back in time. We want to solve cold cases. We want to give closure to victims. It is something that they deserve. And we have found that DNA can be an extremely important asset in doing this, not only with homicide cases, but also in terms of many of the sexual assault cases. We will have an announcement next week, and um, I don't want to roll it all right now, but the fact is that there was a terrible backlog of rape kits for a long time. Well, that backlog has all been tested now. And thank goodness we are at the point where moving forward, rape kits can be tested within 90 days, within a reasonable period of time, which provides a much better situation for victims of sexual assault. We are looking for uh, city council to assist us over a period of perhaps three years with funding for DNA because we believe it is possible that there may be quite a few cases in addition to a, cons in addition to a considerable number of rape and sexual assault cases, quite a few cases including some homicide cases where modern technology makes testing possible that was simply impossible before. And we could bring closure to people who have not had it. We could make sure that the people sitting in jail are actually the ones who did it. And when they're not, we can go after whoever did the original crime who is still out there doing God knows what. In terms of ju juvenile reform, we have seen 63 fewer juveniles initially charged as adults in 18 as compared to 17. And we have seen an 83% decrease in juveniles whose cases remained in adult court after their preliminary hearing. The number of juveniles from Philadelphia in placement facilities has decreased 44%. And speaking of money, so we are all clear. When we talk about whether it's 40,000 to be in jail or 60,000 to be in jail, that's not the number for juveniles. The number for a juvenile in Pennsylvania 
in a placement that is not secure is on the order of $160,000. And the number for a juvenile to be in a secure placement is $220,000 per year. 220 grand. And what you are getting for that, unfortunately, as I think a lot of us know from the scandal surrounding Glenn Mills, is you are frequently getting abuse, which comes in very di various different forms, and you are frequently getting young people coming out of these facilities who cannot graduate high school, cannot get a job, and go back to crime. There has to be a better way, and as it turns out, that better way is also going to be an awful lot less expensive. All right, I think that means I have to stop. Thank you for your patience, Councilman. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kreiser. Um, just start out, I know a number of uh, members have questions, but um, the, uh, purely on the, on, the, on the budget money question, if you will, in the general fund, I think you're asking for, is it 2.75 million additionally? Is that the figure? We're asking for an increase over last year of, I believe it's about 2.9, but it's, it's about that, yes. Okay, over last year. Now, was there a cut in the, in the uh, budget the administration put in? Was there less money given from last year? The, uh, the, cut, the cut was 2.5. 2.5. So. And I would like to point out that my administration actually succeeded in putting away in our piggy bank $2 million because we knew that we had 62 people, new com people coming in at about 60000 apiece. Mm -hmm. So we have been about as fiscally responsible as you can be. Um, and, you know, and I say this respectfully to the administration, we are not in agreement with, um, you know, with having our care when it comes to finances and our, our, you know, respect for the taxpayer turning into some sort of a clawback that will leave us looking like we can't pay for what, what was already agreed upon. Okay. Um, now that, that increase, what is the highlights of where you're going to, that money is going to be spent, if you will? I can't, you kind of went into it here, but I did mention quickly. a number, number yeah. of things, but I'll try to just tick them off. Uh, yeah. One aspect of it is, is money for DNA, which we think should be over three years. Uh, we're asking for a million over three years, so that's on the order of about a third of a million dollars. Another aspect of it is, is to um, increase the uh, economic crimes unit in terms of house theft, things of that sort. Another mm -hmm. aspect of it is the combination of conviction, integrity, and special investigations. This is how we're going to get at cold cases, but it's also how we're going to make sure that the integrity of cases is guaranteed. Just as one example, we have a prosecution now of a homicide detective for multiple sexual assaults. And without commenting further on that, that obviously means we got to take a look at some of the cases that he handled. One of the ways to verify that even if a troubled detective was involved, the defendant is truly guilty is DNA. But we have to have the resources to be able to go in and uh, answer those questions. There has been a request coming especially from clergy for a civil rights enforcement unit. We're talking about a small unit, probably only four attorneys. Uh, the idea there is that they would work with our SVU and specifically work on the issue of illegal, I did say illegal, stop and frisk. In other words, there's a lot of paperwork that is generated when there is a pedestrian stop, and probably the vast majority of that is truthful and accurate, but it might just be that it's not all truthful and accurate. And with the resources of a couple of attorneys, we think we could really restore a lot of community faith in policing by being able to ensure that the information that's put on the paperwork is accurate. It, it, we are hearing a pretty loud cry coming from clergy and community about this. Uh, and, that, you know, that is only one of the things that it could do. There are other things that could be done. We did, for example, have a prosecution this year of corrections officers who were uh, beating up someone in custody. There was video to confirm it, a jury convicted. Um, you know, civil rights in many cases are, have to do with violations of crimes. And so that is another request that we have. Um, we also have a request around uh, yeah. Yes, all right. We are, we are also trying to expand our economic crimes unit to do more work around elder abuse. Uh, this obviously is a city where we have a very significant population of seniors and they deserve to be protected. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. And I just want to mention as a side, the economic crime unit, the increase there I think is, uh, is certainly merited on, particularly on that, uh, on the issue of de-theft. It was something that seemed to be not given priority before. And, you know, most expensive or valuable thing somebody has is their home. You know? right. So it was kind of unusual that it seemed like we didn't want people stealing cars, but there seemed to be more emphasis on car theft than there was house theft, which never made a lot of sense to me. 
One, one more question I had, just, um, and rightly or wrongly, you know, there has been some criticism of uh, lack of communication with victims and fa uh, family uh, a victim of crime. Can you just uh, talk on that a minute? You, you did mention that also in your presentation, but has, has, has that improved, expanded at all, and, you know? Yes, and yes. thank you for that question. Uh, it is extremely important to us that when we are not doing as well as we can, we improve. So one of the things we have done, obviously, is the CARES program, which, as I mentioned before, it's a million and a half new dollars from grants, which are used to help homicide victims and, and to do things like help them to relocate more quickly, make sure that they are safe and they are not intimidated, interface with detectives so those detectives can be out trying to solve those crimes. Another thing that we have done is we have uh, come up with a detailed worksheet, which is to be used in every case where our ADAs are accountable for their efforts to contact victims. They have to put down when they called, how they called, when they emailed, what address did they email, all of the information that would be necessary to show that they really, in a timely fashion, did what it is that they are supposed to do. Um, and I mean, yes, there has been a standard practice before we came in of sending letters a couple times, of making some phone calls, but we have to do better than that. Uh, it is not enough for us to make an effort. The effort we make has to be excellent. And we did speak with Jennifer Storm, who is the statewide victims advocate, who recommended to us various databases that we can use, including things like LexisNexis, for example, in order to do what they consider to be a high level of searching. Um, you know, for victims or, or families of victims and survivors and so on. So we are trying to do that. We've trained all of our staff in that. We consider people to be accountable, and it's the kind of thing that if you don't do, can result in your suspension or, or termination from the office. We are also taking recommendations, obviously, from our Crime Victims Advisory Committee, which is a new committee that we formed. But we, we look, we understand that we have to do better. And even if some of the things we are doing are exactly how it was done in the past with less criticism, that's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. You know, the buck does okay. stop here. We need to step up and do better. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilwoman Parker, please. You just turned my line of questioning all up and down today, uh, D.A. Krasner. Uh, but let me um, start by, uh, by just acknowledging, and I want to do this uh, for the record, because usually when city departments get it wrong, you hear us jumping up and down. But when you work to get it right and the team's working, I think that too uh, should be acknowledged. So I want to um, just state for the record um, uh, that, that Mike Lee, long before uh, criminal justice reform, restorative justice efforts um, relative to expungement and pardons became popular and sexy for people to talk about or be engaged in. Mike Lee was doing it on the ground. So the external validity that he brings from his work outside of your office to your office is extremely valuable. Um, also want to say to uh, Kim Essak, I'm sorry if I chopped your name up, uh, Detective Gerald uh, Rocks and Lauren uh, Townsend, relative to uh, deed fraud and economic crimes overall. They have done a yeoman's job. And, and Councilman Greenlee, in your, uh, in your line of questioning, um, you talked about how uh, neglected the Economic Crimes Unit had been in the past. And I'm shaking my head while you're doing so because I'm looking at pre-Larry Krasner lines of questioning relative to that uh, unit and it was, um, um, basically uh, not supported. So let me just start that, uh, say that on page uh, six of your testimony, um, you asked for um, an investment of uh, uh, $2,785,000 to expand the economic crimes unit and wholeheartedly, a thousand percent, want to say to you on the record that I support that, particularly because of what you laid out relative to what the unit is doing. Right, and we can measure it. Um, next, I want to say this because the questions I had prepared, you just totally, you know, turned them upside down. I don't know who the person is or the team is who does the technology for your office, but I want you to know that never before, as a visual learner, I am a visual learner, never before have I seen quantitative data with the actual uh, sources uh, listed um, and visuals about how the department is attempting to educate the public about true stats um, versus myths 
that become popular because we read them in a newspaper or we hear them on the radio and uh, they are not true. So I want you to help me make sure that I've digested these stats accurately. I want to start with page one. Can you go to back to oh, the page one in your presentation? This is where you give us an overview of violent crime in the city of Philadelphia. I've been through I don't know how many community-based uh, meetings uh, this year and some in 2018, and I've often heard, um, you know, violent crime is up in the city of Philadelphia. And so much so, when you constantly hear a myth repeated, I will dare say to you that members of the public have embraced this as, um, you, know, you know, the truth for our city. But am I, am I accurately reading this? And if I'm not, please let me know. I'm trying to become a more critical consumer of research. Um, you say that total violent crime offenses in the city of Philadelphia are down by 5% but we do see an increase in homicides at 10%, and you attribute this to. Can you finish that line for me? Yes, yes, I can. So, again, this is data from the Philadelphia Police Department, and these are not solved cases. These are actual complaints of particular crimes. And what it shows us with the highlighter blue line is that according to the Philadelphia Police Department for the entire year 2018, there was a 5% reduction in violent crime, including some considerable improvements. For example, robbery with a gun down 12%, other robberies down 14%, and rape down 9%. Obviously, that is good news. It is not good news when we look at the top line right. and we see that homicide is up 10%, and it's not good news when we look at the line which is two above the blue line, and it says aggravated assault slash gun, that that is up 5%. Right. Now, uh, you know, our commissioner, Commissioner Ross, frankly, I'm a big fan, and we have an excellent working relationship, and so we are able to talk and frequently do talk about these things. And, and his conclusion, having looked at the motives attributed to those homicides by the Philadelphia Police Department after they were investigating each case, his conclusion is that the jump in violent uh, excuse me, the jump in homicides is related to an increase in the number of those homicides motivated by drugs from 60 in 2017 approximately to 120 in 2018. Other categories of homicide, for example, domestic homicides or, you know, other disputes, things of that sort, did not really change. But the one categ category that doubled was uh, drug-related homicides. I, you know, I think if we reflect on that, it kind of makes sense. In the middle of a massive opioid crisis in one of the most troubled counties in the United States, that that, that will happen. That is obviously not an answer, but it's always good to have science and statistics to know what's really going on. Next question I want to go to, and if Councilwoman Reynolds Brown um, were here relative uh, to your presentation about diversity and inclusion, um, I, I, I think she would uh, be uh, very pleased with the data that you've presented, and that to me it looks like um, you have looked this monster in the face, and you have realized that systemically over the years there has been a balance, particularly racially, in the district attorney's office and that when we look at the number of people who are being prosecuted by that office versus the number of those who are prosecuting the actual cases, that those, there's a major uh, imbalance there. So you give us the pre-Krasner um, numbers um, overall, and then you give us the ADAs uh, only. And so it looks like there is an 8%, uh, an 8% 8 increase um, in relative to the new hires in diversity? Am I accurate in, in summarizing the data that way? Councilwoman, you are accurate, except this is 8% before the new class comes in. Before the, before the class comes in. Now I want you to um, go to the next slide. And this is what is impressive. You've outlined the strategy for recruitment, and I am happy um, to see that you've included the institutions of higher learning that you've actually, you and or members of your team, you've actually uh, visited. We actually get a snapshot, a visual, to see who these people are coming to work in the city of Philadelphia and serve in that office. Never before, 
Never before have we seen this kind of interactive technology used to affirm that this is how we are trying to make improvements to diversify a particular office. I am going to humbly recommend to uh, our administration that every department in the city of Philadelphia um, reviews this presentation that you've given and find out if there is a way um, for us to adopt something similar so that we can make it the standard operating procedure for the city of Philadelphia. Because if I'm a resident of this city that is majority minority, and I'm looking at the, the number of people of color who, um, who are working for the city and those who are in executive positions, um, it is no doubt that I want to see that number increase. But to provide the methodology and say, I'm not just telling you, this is where we've gone. And the HBCUs, I'm biased, right? I want you there every chance you can be there. So I thank you for documenting that. But to also then show us who's coming. It hasn't been done. You should be commended for it. Um, if it wasn't and you didn't come in here, because I read a report not long ago that gave us a snapshot of sort of what the district attorney's office uh, looked like, and it was dismal. Right, and so appreciate you acknowledging that, listen, we are not where we should be, even though we've made some strides, but we are well on our way, and this is the methodology and the strategies and the tactics that we are using to get there. Um, I'll come back and I, I'll have some more questions during the second round, thank you. Well, thank you, count, thank you uh, council member, and I, I would like to point out that the people who did that are much smarter than me, and I don't know how to do it, so all of them are sitting here, and thank you for what you all did. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Jones? <clears throat> With all due respect to my colleague, Councilwoman Parker, who I try never to be on the other side of an argument That's with. That's a smart move, actually. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to take the exception today to say that Defender Gray always puts together a slideshow that is informative, uh, budgetarily and quantitatively uh, correct. So I want you to stick around until you, until you <laughs> hear her presentation. I, I also want to echo uh, my colleagues' uh, pleasure. It's easier to digest complicated information when it is presented correctly. Uh, so I appreciate that and uh, look forward to uh, every other department up in their game uh, to, to make sure we get uh, the proper information. Um, a couple of questions that, that I would have. So I was appreciative that you highlighted how much money you needed for the purposes that you wanted it. It was about three million. Can you clarify, did you get cut last year or did you receive the amount of money anticipated from last year's budget that we appropriate? I believe we did receive the amount that you all approved. From, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right, I just want to make sure. You know, we, we appropriate, that don't mean you receive it, uh, and that happens often. So a couple of things. One, I'd like to draw attention to crimes against seniors um, and to get your office's uh, take on how we emphasize, protect our most vulnerable uh, populations uh, from being victimized both economically, but in particular, um, when we look at some of the guardianships that have gone on and a lot of seniors are being taken advantage of. Uh, Mrs. Smith works all her life, uh, gets savings and equity in a home, and then through uh, orphan's court, often they are appointed a guardian. That guardian, once given that authority, then gets to make financial decisions, often independent of the families that uh, Ms. Smith, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Smith, uh, used to have are now taken somewhat out of the, pic out of the picture. Uh, so much so that uh, Governor Wolf has taken measures and steps to try to protect that population, creating new guardianships rules. Ha has your office had an opportunity uh, to take a look at some of those processes and uh, create a unit that looks out for them on traditional hardcore crimes where they are victims, but also financial crimes where they are victimized? Um, well, there is what I can talk about and what I can't. I can tell you this is a matter of great concern to us. 
We are no fans of bullies in any form. And this is the worst kind of bully, in my mind, someone who deliberately goes out and finds people who have no resources mm -hmm. so that they can take advantage of them by virtue of physical disability or mental incapacity or, frankly, just lack of resources. Um, there are times when I can say more and I can say less, but I can tell you it's of great concern to us, and with additional funding, there's more that we can do. So um, the second question I would have is witness protection and intimidation. Without a witness, there is a harder case to prove. How are we looking to do that? And I gave you an idea that I will put on the record of working with PHA HUD to create a series of houses that would be created for witnesses that needed that type of protection. And after a certain period of time, maybe two years, we'd sell those houses and create another dozen houses in different parts of the city or even suburbs that people could occupy and then that sale of that house could replenish and create the uh, revenue for a new set of houses. And I would love for you to, um, you don't have to say you, you, you've already done it, but that you'll look into it. it would be good. Number one, yes, we will look into it. Uh, it. You know, in my mind, an idea something along those lines, absolutely excellent idea. We do have a relocation expert now who is working diligently. I know that before we came in, there were times when not all the funding available was being used in a city that's experiencing this level of violence. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So we are vigorous about relocation where there are issues of safety. We're vigorous about going after people and bringing new charges for intimidating a witness or for retaliation against a witness in whatever form. Uh, and that continues to be aided by our new CARES program because it simply puts more people in close contact with the families of victims of homicide where historically there have been some pretty tragic and terrible outcomes and intimidation is real. But there is another idea we're working on now and we've had a very, um, I think, very amicable and receptive FJD thus far. And that idea is to take the shooting cases and to put them in the same courtrooms where homicide cases are being done. Our thinking around that is that all of these cases are essentially the same case. It's just that in the homicide case, the medical result was different, or maybe the aim was different, but you're still firing projectiles, bullets at human beings. Um, and often it will raise the same issues of some sort of a dispute between two different cohorts of young men, often it'll raise the same issues of protection and fear, code of the street, things of that sort. So we are happy to report that we've been exchanging data uh, you know, with various stakeholders and that we are looking forward to the possibility of our having our best lawyers in those rooms and our best victims advocates of the defender, if should they be involved, having their best lawyers in the room so they can do the best job of our giving discovery early for the reason that it is protective it makes it useless to kill a witness when you have provided all of the information early so that witness's testimony can be used later, right? Disincentivize doing harm to witnesses and do it in a way so that we have everything in place in terms of sheriffs and other forms of protection so that these cases can move along fairly and quickly. I would much rather see the, how shall I put it, colleagues of a defendant accused of shooting see a result in nine months than in 18 months. Because one of the things we know about deterrence it is, is that is, it is more an issue of how swift the consequence is than the number of years. And when, heaven forbid, the other fellows on the corner see that one of their group is going to jail and is going to jail in nine months, that will have a greater deterrent effect than waiting 18 months and having that person go to jail for a longer period of time. Uh, that's good. Hopefully we'll get in future years some cooperation from HUD and PHA to, to help you. The four fixture process, how has that evolved since you've been in office? It has evolved tremendously. There was a lawsuit pending for quite some time, as you may know, and when we came into the office, the funds that had been derived from forfeiture were frozen in accounts for the DAO. Um, and they were frankly frozen for good reason, because there was a lot of money that was effectively stolen in prior administration by processes that uh, everybody pretty much agrees at this point were wrong. What, what happened was there was a keep what you kill approach. 
And all that it did was incentivize the prosecutors to always try to take grandma's house, always try to take a, you know, a working person's car, and often to do it simply because somebody's nephew did something illegal out of the basement, and you know, the owner, who may have been at church, didn't know. So it was bad. It never should have happened. I won't go into all the details, but the litigation has been settled at this time. And what is going to happen with the litigation is that a lot of people who were harmed will be able to make a claim and receive funds that will go to restore them. Um, it hasn't, it, it is not kicked off yet. There's a couple more signatures required, including the federal judge involved. For any funds that remain after all these claims have been made and have been resolved in perhaps a year or so or a year or more, the agreement that my office has pushed and, is, and has made is that residual funds should go into the zip codes from which they were taken and be used for things like programming at recreation centers or other things that will build up those communities rather than just take it out and put it in a general fund. In terms of our internal, internal processes, the law has changed considerably, and that's a good thing, and our policies have changed considerably. In general, there are a few exceptions, but in general, we are not going after uh, assets unless, number one, they are the assets of the person who has already been convicted. Number two, they are proportional and appropriate to the extent of the crime. Um, so in general, we're looking at a situation where all of the crazy processes that were going on before have been discontinued. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilman. I also want to echo my colleagues. It's an excellent presentation, and uh, your progress is impressive. Um, I also appreciate very much your acknowledgement and the facts you presented on the potential savings that we could uh, accrue for the city. So I wanted to just revisit those two slides. Maybe we could just go over those again, just to so make may, sure we're all clear. Wait, may we grow to the whole, go to the whole group of cost savings slides, please? We actually have um, a few that we have not shown yet. Councilman, is there anything in particular you'd like to look at? There were two slides in particular, I think. One was uh, the prison population reduction, and one may have been towards the probation cost savings. There it is. Yes, I think we're looking at slides That's number four and five. I just wanted to make sure I understood this slide, where it says 82 million in the lower right corner. It says lower cost of incarceration per quarter. Is that the savings we would accrue? So what we measured here was the future cost of incarceration. Let us say, for example, someone goes to a sentencing today in Philadelphia court and is sentenced to 40 years in jail. If the price of a year in jail is approximately $50,000, that is a $2 million price tag right there. So we are, we are trying to figure out the, the, how much of a future bill is generated in a courtroom. So we looked at a quarter, meaning three months of court activity, and then we looked at the uh, debt that was essentially being generated in terms of future incarceration or future supervision. So what this graph is showing is it's comparing a period in 2014, the first quarter of the year 2014, and how many future years of incarceration the courts generated, which of course has something to do with the DA, it has something to do with the judge. Um, and then we put a price on it, and then we compared it to what's going on now. As you can see from the red line, the red line shows the decline in the future years of incarceration that are being generated in each quarter. So we've come down quite a bit in, in terms of how many future years. And then we turned that into a dollar figure by using actually a very conservative number, which is the Vera Institute's number of about $42,000 a year. And I agree with you, Councilman, that the actual cost in county is much higher than that. And certainly the cost for juvenile cases is astronomically higher than that. But it gives a window on, on what magnitude of potential savings we're talking about. If, if you can save $82 million in a quarter by pursuing a different philosophy, <laughs> if we simply multiply that out as some kind of rough estimate of potential savings, not actual savings, because yes, there are going to be fixed costs and so on, you're looking at $328 million a year during a four-year administration you're looking at, a, what is that, about $1.3 billion a year. Now, this is both state custody and it is county custody. There are currently in state custody about 12 to 13,000 Philadelphians. We generate 27% of the state prisoners for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And then, of course, it's the people in county, and that at the moment is about 4,500 people. So it measures all of that cost. But I don't, I don't accept the siloed argument that we can never have any input in how the state 
spends its money. That just doesn't make any sense. If the state is not going to have to spend a fortune to put people in jail for too long, then they should be able to, to redirect that money and reinvest it in Philadelphia and things that prevent crime, like education and treatment and economic development. Can we look at the next slide, too? I just want to make sure I understand that one. Yes, please. Uh, next slide is number five. <coughs> Now, this, this does not talk about incarceration. This talks about supervision, by which I mean parole and probation. Uh, Pennsylvania is weird in that it requires that the period of your supervision is ordinarily at least as long as your incarceration. It is pro a problem we can't fix because state law says what it says, and hopefully that will change at some point. But it has made Pennsylvania currently the second worst state in the United States for excessive supervision. The worst is Georgia, but Georgia just went and changed all its laws because it was tired of being the worst. So soon enough, Pennsylvania will be the worst. That has real economic consequences. Um, and what this is showing is that it's a similar comparison. If we look at the number of future years of supervision that were generated in the first quarter of 2014, which is up in your, it's on your upper left there, you'll see it was about 15,007 imposed, assuming I'm reading that correctly. And then if we look at the fourth quarter of 2018, when we had been in office for a little bit, you'll see it's more like 7,666. So it's about half of what it used to be. That savings in terms of years is 7,341 years of parole and probation. And there is a dollar cost to that. That dollar cost was obtained from official documents. And once again, I'm not saying that we can have this money tomorrow. There are fixed costs. I, for one, am not asking for any reduction in the number of probation officers in the county of Philadelphia. I would just like them to have a caseload that they can work with. But there are other savings to be had. And the potential saving uh, on this sort of basic measure is $13.8 million per quarter, which comes in at about $53, $54 million, maybe 55 in a year. Make it a four-year term, you're $220 million. It's a lot of money. I'm trying to figure this simple question out that I've been asking for two years, or three years maybe, since I've been here. And you documented this. We had a population of 8,900. We're down to 4,600, roughly. And yet our overall budget has not moved that much. I think this year they're talking about maybe 3.5% um, savings in the budget. And when he had a population reduction of close to 50 percent, I don't understand. I'm not exact asking for 50, but I was told a year and a half ago, you won't see significant savings until the House of Corrections closes. Well, that closed. And so I'm just putting it right on the table that I'm not asking for 50, but it seems to me that 15 to 20 percent should be a goal we could strive for. And I still don't look. Our medical contract was 42 million when we had a bigger population. We have half the population, and the medical contract is $49 million. And I realize medical costs go up. I'm not sure they've doubled in that time period. So I, there's a lot there that I think that can be saved. And, I'm, and this, these charts and what you're showing, I think, proves that out. I'm not asking for 50. I understand the infrastructure costs. But 15 percent, or that's a lot of money if you have a budget that's 370, 380 with fringe benefits, and you're talking 20 percent, that's $76 million a year. <laughs> Well, I, uh, Councilman, I can certainly say I don't claim to be a financial expert, but I have yet to see why it is if you're unloading meals and it's half as many meals or you are treating people who undoubtedly have fairly similar conditions to what they had back when we had almost 10,000 people in jail. I, it, it is beyond explanation to me why somehow the bill to the, to the taxpayer never goes down no matter how low the population goes. Well, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman O. Thank you very much. Um, I understand the presentation. Um, I would expect it from the public defender's office, from the court, from probation. I understand what you're trying to reach. Um, can you explain to me what funding you need for prosecution? What funding we need for prosecution? Yes. We need our entire budget for prosecution. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be flip. Perhaps I misunderstand, Councilman. I'm not taking you as flip. Okay. What funding we need for prosecution is everything that's laid out in our budget. And the truth is that uh, with the additional funding 
that we are requesting for things like prosecuting economic crimes for, for measures that can help us to solve cold cases and assure the accuracy of the system, we feel that there's more that we can do than the office has ever done. When we are looking at potential savings, at least potential savings that are in the billions of dollars, um, frankly, we think that our request for a little bit under $3 million is very moderate. The, the capacity of hiring the right people to focus on the cases that really matter and find a few where we don't ask for those extra 10 years because they're the appropriate cases. I mean, the savings that are generated simply by doing the job better and being really surgical about how you do it are astronomical astronomical. A single case where 10 extra years would have been not in the interest of the public, that's half a million bucks. So we're really, I mean, the reality is for the extra amount of money that we are seeking here, we basically got to make like six good decisions of that nature are, in the course of a year. I mean, even if... Are, are you deciding as the DA that the 10 extra years or five extra years of supervision, probation, incarceration are not worth it? Is that, is that the decision that you're making? In some cases it is. I can tell you, for example, the Columbia Justice Lab, uh, under, the, um, under the supervision of Vinnie Schiraldi, who's the former chief probation officer for the city of New York, and probably the nation's leading scholar on probation and parole, released a report in April of 2018 that talks specifically about Philadelphia and also about Pennsylvania, and what the science shows is that supervision for more than three years tends to be harmful. It's not simply ineffective. It is harmful. It tends to put people, and this is a generality, because there are always individual situations where longer supervision or shorter is appropriate. But it makes people fail. Yeah. So if, if what we're actually doing is we're pay, paying for things that reduce public yeah. safety, okay. um, you know, part of my oath is to, is to seek justice, and that means also protecting people. And so that's why we yeah. have to make decisions like that, okay. Councilman. So, so I do understand the arguments. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them all. I don't disagree with many of them. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that the system of justice, whether we like it or not, uh, has been and is based on roles. The role of the court, the role of the judge, the role of the jury, the role of probation, the role of social services, the role of private attorneys, public defenders, um, and the role of the prosecutor. And the role of the prosecutor to present vigorous prosecution and to be met with vigorous defense to bring out the truth and for another party, the judge, the jury, to make that decision and from there, the prisons commission, um, social services, probation, parole, the, the parole board to make other decisions. Um, in that, to that degree, um, the vigorous prosecution portion of the duty of the district attorney's office, could you put that into context within your decision to withdraw the appeal in the Mumia Abul Jamal case? Well, Councilman, as you, as you know, and I've known you for, and for a very long yes. time, and I respect yes. you, and uh, as you know, having been a former prosecutor yourself, yes. um, I am not allowed to speak at great length about a pending matter. We have certainly answered uh, issues in relation to that, and we've done so in a way that was in court filings. We have made the, that information specific, and we also released a statement on it. Um, I am very comfortable with that decision, which, as you know, was initially, in light of the first opinion of the court, uh, to appeal it, and then after the court changed its first opinion to withdraw that appeal. We are very comfortable with that, and I realize that it has angered both people on the left and the right. But I guess there's another way to look at this, that, which is perhaps we've become the great uniter. And perhaps when you see both sides angry at the district attorney, it means that we are proceeding in a way that is independent and balanced, regardless of who may find, you know, who may feel differently about that particular issue. Let me say this, though, if I may, and I, I've, I have great respect for you, and I respect your questions about it. Um, if we could have the violent crime slides, please. So we are clear. Um, this office has vigorously. Now we are speaking of violent crime one and two, which is the declinations graph. This this office has 
shown a measure of what we think is just mercy when it comes to nonviolent offenses, offenses that come from poverty and comes from addiction. We think that's the right way to do it. But what we have not done, yes, thank you. What we have not done is turned away from the vigorous prosecution of violent crimes. What you have here is an accounting of the rate at which in a prior administration, that administration would decline or refuse to charge a VUFA case, VUFA being a violation of the Uniform Firearms Act. And as you can see, in 2016 and 2017, during an administration that was frankly much more retributive and much more rule-bound and much more oriented towards giving people long sentences, they were also declining more cases. They were refusing to prosecute more gun cases than we are. Our declination rate is under 2%. Their declaration rate was almost 3% in 16 and down to about 2.5% in 17. This is the truth. These are the facts. This is, this is the reality. And if you look at the, what's coming out of our homicide unit, you will see that the results are excellent. They are excellent in terms of obtaining guilty pleas to the appropriate level, and they are excellent in terms of obtaining convictions. And I'm happy to see that Council President Clark is here because this is also the first administration that has what, been willing to do what, what uh, Council President Clark and other members of this august body have asked us to do for a long time, which is enforce an ordinance that says if you're going to claim your gun got lost and, or stolen, you better do it in 48 hours instead of doing it after somebody gets shot to death with it when, the, when you know, the detectives come to your door to find out why you bought it and why it got used in a killing. Uh, we are serious as can be about pursuing violent crime and pursuing sexual assault and things of that sort. And we view our, uh, our reform impulses when it comes to nonviolent offenses and things of that sort as supporting our ability to go after violent crime because it allows us to focus on what really matters. All right, I'll, I'll just end with this um, as we kind of go to the next rounds. Um, you are the elected district attorney and uh, you are properly holding office. I don't agree with everything you do. I agree with many things you do, but that's not the basis of my question. Um, uh, what I would like to understand is, as a defense attorney, I understand that the defense attorney's responsibility is to singularly the accused or the convicted, and as many times as they will bring what I might term frivolous um, appeals and uh, that's their job. The court makes a decision. But they should be met with vigorous defense of those frivolous appeals with equal vigor. That's how our system works. Um, to that extent, I express my opinion. I want to understand um, kind of like the funding of where is this money going? I'm not really that interested, quite frankly, as a primary issue of saving funds, because to me, the prosecutor is there for public safety reasons, saving lives, preventing physical harm, danger to the, the population. I appreciate your role in uh, trying to make sure the system is more just and fair. Um, and, and to that extent, you know, I, I want to apart from whether I like or don't like what you're doing, try to understand you know, your requests, where it's going, and how I shall look at this. I'm just one of 17. I appreciate your, your answers. Um, I, I'm asking you, you know, genuinely, and I appreciate your genuine answers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to thank you for you and your team being available as we need it when we get these cases and, uh, and uh, certainly most recently for a young man and, uh, um, who was a victim of crime. And I'd also like to uh, thank you for modifying this area of probation and parole and what you've done about people having cash. All that's been really creative, really new things we didn't uh, expect and we're grateful. Um, I'm always interested in victim witness services, but Councilman Greenlee already brought that issue up. So um, 
We hope that uh, all that you think you need, you get. We support you and we thank you all. Well, thank, thank you, Councilwoman. You. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, I mean, Mr. Chairman. Can you um, go back to the first slide again that showed the, uh, the crime? I'm wondering, um, District Attorney, um, if it is at all uh, possible, and if this is something um, I can also ask of the police department, I will. In these uh, areas where you sort of summarize the types of crime that um, is, is taking place, um, and I'm really thinking about economic crimes here, really. Um, if you, if your office, particularly if your budget request is granted for you to bolster, um, you know, the, 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 this department, this unit, would you be able to GIS for us by council district the, the, the crime, the economic crimes, where, where they are, actually are in the city of Philadelphia? The answer, and I can tell you this because I'm looking at the gentleman to your right who does such maps, the answer is yes, and we would be delighted to do that. And that would be, um, that would be very uh, helpful. And I know Councilman Jones um, and, and, and I relative to um, the rates of home ownership in our, in our region, um, you know, we're 52% here in the city. And although people talk about, you know, Philadelphia, we are the largest, poorest, big city, um, you know, in the nation, a lot of people don't talk about what we do well and that and although that 52 percent is actually um has it's been declining because it was much you know hot higher than that we've we definitely have to take seriously this issue of protecting um the greatest assets of uh, philadelphians in our homes so but when, and when you are providing that data uh for us and you are doing it by council districts I'm not telling you what a tool that is for us when we have to go out and interface with the public. That's getting misinformation uh, from time to time from different sources, and they're saying that, you know, in, in our neighborhood, and I'll give you an example. The, the, what's really driving me to ask you to GIS this is because when I look at property crime, I see an increase um, where it says, where is this 5%? Uh, no, theft from, theft from auto a 5% increase. And, um, you know, I've shared with you that um, in, in my district in the ninth, in a particular region, we have had an onslaught of thefts from Hondas. And the police department has talked about this publicly. I think they've introduced um, a, a, a press release about it to the public to sort of educate them. But the challenge is the residents in that particular region are saying to me, why aren't they being prosecuted? If the police are investigating and they know um, who is still in this particular part, and if I screw this up, District Attorney, correct me, Catholic, Catalytic converter. Ca catalytic, com catalytic converters. And they are, um, they are really like on a rampage yep. in a certain region. And so I guess I, 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 that's why I want to see all, all of these kinds of crimes um, really GIS, but the property crimes in, in particular so that we can see where they are. But I also want you, uh, District Attorney, to, to sort of finish this for me. When someone tells me that they are very proud of, 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 of what you've done in, in helping to reform bail, um, in helping to, um, you know, sort of, you know, decrease uh, the, the, the amount or the path Philadelphia was on towards mass incarceration, all of the efforts that you've been, you know, sort of, you know, people hail you for those efforts. But what about in the neighborhoods where we have quality of life issues? like graffiti. We work on a commercial corner and um, we work very hard for years to turn it around. And then, you know, we get a rash of writings and we go out there, we paint it. Next thing you know, it's back again. Um, the theft from the, the autos, 
all of those quality of life issues when people tell us, well, the district attorney's office in Philadelphia doesn't prosecute quality of life issues. And then homeowners begin to say to us, you know, you're the district council person. Your job is to sit in council and determine whether or not you should be approving that budget. If they're not interested in quality of life issues, why would you, uh, why won't you raise it and what, what are you going to do to address it? What's the response regarding that perception? And the response is that's untrue. The, I will tell you exactly what we're not prosecuting, exactly what we are. We are not prosecuting mere possession of marijuana, which is an initiative that in many ways was started, uh, you know, through efforts of the mayor and, and others uh, in council several years ago, and about 90% of those cases went away through that new ticketing process, and the approximately 10% that remained when we came in, we will not prosecute. That is possession. possession. I did not say sales. I did not say possession with the intent to sell. I said possession. We are also not prosecuting sex workers at this time unless they have a lengthy record, in which case they go to a specific uh, court. Sex, we, did you say sex workers? Sex workers. And, okay, connected to we, this, we human are, traffic. Great, great note. Correct. We are, we are prosecuting pimps. We are prosecuting Johns. Uh, when it comes to all of these theft offenses, we are prosecuting those offenses. Now, prosecution sometimes means you're going to go all the way to a conviction at trial or a guilty plea, and sometimes it means you're going to divert, depending on what the causes are. But diversion is still accountability. It is still a pair of handcuffs. It is still a jail cell. It is still going to court repeatedly. It is still money. It is still community service time. It is still work. It can be a lot of things. So what you are hearing, and I say this uh, respectfully, is either misinformation or it is politics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when the policies being followed make sense, mm -hmm. it is politically useful to say there are different policies. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate um, that response from you. And again, j just similar to the way you've produced this data, providing us with the overview um, of the rate of, of violent crime uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Just hearing you, as the DA, give that response during this budget hearing on the record for Philadelphians who are not sitting in this room. They didn't hear from Sherelle. They didn't hear from someone else. They just very specifically got an outline of what is and what is not being prosecuted in the district attorney's office. Um, next question for me is Marcy's Law. Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown and I um, have been working uh, very hard uh, with that group. Um, you know, the Pennsylvania General Assembly uh, passed it. Um, and uh, I just want, as our district attorney, again, to get your perspective about Marcy's Law on the record. So, our perspective is that we believe that Marcy's Law uh, in general is appropriate. We did offer a few suggestions for, for friendly modifications, and it looks like they may not have an effect, but in general, we are supportive of Marcy's Law here and elsewhere. Thank you. And Mr. President, I know I heard my time is up, but if you could just, uh, I could ask one more question, Mr. President. When um, I was working with a group called uh, Leadership of Philadelphia, um, wow, I'm telling my age, I forgot how long ago it was. But there was, um, we had to work on a, a public community service project. And uh, Majunto um, formed a partnership with the Pennsylvania Prison Society. It was at that time that I learned about a program um, that they ran called SKIP. It was support for kids with incarcerated uh, parents. And I'm wondering, um, as our district attorney, um, are we, um, I don't know if I would say seeing a, um, a, an increase in the number of children who are being impacted as a result of their caregivers, providers, or parents um, being prosecuted by the department? And is there a working relationship between the district attorney's office, um, I don't know, social services, or any other entities um, that um, have a role in ensuring that the children of the people who are arrested and then prosecuted by your office, that there is like a coordinated approach in delivering social services um, to them? And if you don't have the answer to that, district attorney, that is okay. I would just like to put on the record that if there is a way that the police department, the prosecutor, your office, along with human services, that can work together um, to support this very vulnerable constituency, I would ask that you do so. Council President Clark, um, was it Ohio that you all visited when you came up with the concept for community schools? Yes. 
Cincinnati. Correct. C- c- in Cincinnati. But the reason why I ask is because that whole community schools concept that you'd be surprised how many children like you are facing trauma and 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 dealing with the uh, residual effect of having lost a parent or a loved one to the criminal justice system and we don't understand you know why these kids are having a tough time behaviorally in school and I'm just wondering if from a very just an organizational perspective if that could be some dialogue in the future well thank you for that question um Councilwoman, and, and with your permission, I'd like to have First Assistant Liston be speak to that point. Councilwoman Parker, at this time, I'm not aware of any particular relationship that we have with the organization that you referenced. I would note that uh, just last week I was in Arizona and Phoenix where I gave the keynote speech at the National Conference of Children of Incarcerated Parents. It's an issue that I've dealt with uh, formerly as administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. I sponsored two conferences at the White House and worked closely with uh, the Obama administration to help develop responses to those children. So we're open to it. It's something that I'm more than willing to work uh, with folks here in Philadelphia on, something I personally have a very strong interest in. Council, may I just say one more thing? I would also like to highlight, and I apologize for going on forever, but I'd like to highlight that we have a a very important new new initiative this year. It's probably going to take about a year to complete, which will be led by Judge Tem, and and that is an initiative to go specifically after the impact of incarceration on women and girls. Um, Since this idea came up, there has been an outpouring of interest coming from different organizations uh, and different individuals because we feel that obviously it's not all the children, of incarcerated parents, but it certainly is plenty of girls, and so we're looking into that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. DA. Um, Chair recognizes Councilman Taubenberger. Council President, thank you very, very much. A um, couple questions and some comments. Mr. Krasner, I am very, very impressed with your uh, recruitment opportunities and, and uh, that you have done for the class of 2019. Once again, as it was stated earlier, the diversity, but the fact that uh, you have reached to get what I would assume uh, is some of the brightest in America. I think that's a great way to build a, a very, very, very good district attorney's office. I do have a question that relates to a question that I'm asked uh, many times as a city council member at large regarding safe injection sites. Mm-hmm. Do you have a position on that? Or well, I do, have, that? I do have a position in the sense that the only issue that I will face uh, or may face is whether or not as the local prosecutorial authority I would prosecute it. And my answer has been and remains that I will not prosecute a responsibly run supervised injection site for the same reason that in a prior life when I was a young attorney I defended Prevention Point, which we now all accept as being an appropriate clean needle exchange program and we now all laud its benefits in terms of preventing the spread of hepatitis C, preventing the spread of HIV at a time when AIDS really was a terrifying specter that killed over 900 people in a single year. We now all accept that as being an okay thing, but we didn't then. At that, at that time, uh, Ernie Priate, who was the Attorney General, was threatening to prosecute all of them, and he was threatening to do so because he had a claim, and it was not a frivolous claim, that he could have gone after them for uh, violating contraband, uh, a contraband type statute, meaning that the needles were in fact for the purposes of, uh, of people who would then take it and use it to inject drugs. I, su- I support not prosecuting supervised injection site for one reason that is moral and one reason that is legal. And the moral reason is that dead people cannot recover. And if we do not give people the ability to survive long enough to achieve their own recovery, then I think we have all failed. There are three to four people who die every single day in Philadelphia from fatal drug overdoses. Most of it is coming from opioids and especially with fentanyl, which is so volatile. It's incredibly unpredictable. Fentanyl has now, by the way, creeped into the crack supply. And so we are seeing people who may have been addicted to crack for 25 years doing what they have always done and ending up dead. It is a bona fide crisis. And that is the moral reason as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how how I could do anything else, but there is a legal reason, which is that under Pennsylvania law, we have the defense of justification, and what we generally know that to be is self-defense. But what it says is you can break a law that is not as serious as the harm you prevent, okay? It's, it's, I mean, it's a principle that comes out of uh, the Old Testament, among others. 
And so when the husband is driving at 100 miles an hour to get to the emergency room because something terrible is happening with his wife's pregnancy and he has a real fear that she's going to die if he doesn't get there quickly, he has a defense. He shouldn't have gone 105 ordinarily, but he has a defense because it was justified in order to prevent the loss of life to his wife or child. And that's what's happening here. What's happening here is you have idealistic medical students, you have activists who are trying by responsible means to stop death from occurring. Uh, and in my mind, that is what the law says. The law says under Pennsylvania that this is justified and therefore unworthy of prosecution. I understand that our, our federal prosecutor and appointee of uh, our president, Donald Trump, has a different view, but frankly, he and I have different views on a whole lot of things. Um, and I do not, and I say this very respectfully to you, Councilman, I'm not suggesting you're making this argument at all, um, and I have great respect for you, but I don't respect, I don't accept the notion that people are going to decide, gee, there's a supervised injection site, I've never injected drugs, I think it sounds like a good Saturday night to try. I mean, to me, that argument is about as hollow as the argument used to be that if condoms are available, then teens will try sex for the first time. No, actually, they were going to have sex anyway. They were just going to have unprotected sex, and there was going to be more pregnancy, and there was going to be more transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. People do not say, gee whiz, now that there's a supervised injection site, I can hardly wait to inject heroin. They just don't do that. So I do not accept the notion that it normalizes. I don't think it does that at all. I consider it to be a medical facility, the purpose of which is to make sure people who don't have to die don't die so they can achieve their own redemption by recovery later. Thank you for your uh, very complete answer on that, and uh, I have to say also well-founded. I don't agree entirely with it, but uh, every position you've had here is, is well-founded, and in, in you have uh, explained your reasoning, and uh, I, I appreciate that. Earlier you had said that the uh, – correct me if I'm wrong or if I got this wrong – that inmates under the age of 18 cost taxpayers approximately $220,000 per year, whereas adults cost the, the system $45,000. If that is correct, why such a big difference, such a variance? Uh, I'll give a quick answer, then I'm going to defer to First Assistant Listenby because, I mean, in fact, he essentially led juvenile justice for, for the President of the United States. But, um, the short answer to that question is these numbers come from state authorities, uh, and you know the what is involved with incarcerating an adult is less than is involved with incarcerating and also educating a juvenile. It can be a very expensive proposition, ex especially if there is at least some effort to do so in a way that is humane. But I will defer to first assistant listening. Uh, Councilman, as the DA indicated, these are um, statistics coming from the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the uh, Office of Juvenile Justice under the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Um, the, it's very expensive because you have uh, major mental health components as well as uh, educational components that are part of the cost of running a statewide facility. A state secure facility is 24 hours. You have to have guards and everything else that goes along with that. Sure. Um, it's less but, expensive. But that's the same uh, for, for adults as well. They have 24 hour. Um, it is, but there are elements of education that are required. Okay, well, that was, of, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and are these, in, these minors, these under 18 year olds, are they getting schooling while they're? They're required to have schooling, yes. Okay. And, and you say under 18, it's any, uh, under the juvenile justice system, it's up to age 21. So many of the young people who are in our juvenile justice facilities are, are there between the ages of, of 10 and uh, the ages of uh, 21. Do you know what is involved in that schooling? Uh, they're required to meet the same state standards as the children here in Philadelphia are. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the city of Philadelphia sometimes pays for the private facilities uh, for <laughs> children who are placed in other counties and in other school systems provide the educational component. Philadelphia's um, school district pays for that. And if somebody wants more detail, they really should look at the, at the state report. Is that correct? Yes, or? absolutely. Okay. All right. and, and, and just let me just add, uh, the, 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 the cost that, that the DA has been re referencing uh, um, one positive aspect of it is that the number of children who are in placement uh, under D.A. Krasner that are from Philadelphia County has declined uh, from uh, December 2017 when we were at 600 and, 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 um, 608 to uh, 338 as of April of this year. So policies that we put in place to carefully monitor um, 
the children who are going into placement, uh, cost factors involved with them, uh, have helped to reduce the number of kids going into placement and again, has not had, caused any increase in, in crime in this area. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Chair Ricknaz, Councilman Don. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon again. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer, but do you know the time frame from, from when someone is arrested to the time they go to trial? Yes, and thank you for asking that question. It's been a, a matter of some interest. Now I just have to figure out where we have that slide. Do you know where we have it? Okay. If I may just have a moment. I believe we have it in our chart. We have it under the category of crime. It would be slide number eight. So um, what we are seeing, if we look at the year 2018 until now, for felony matters, and I, th I think this does not include homicides, but for felony matters, what we are seeing is that when we first came uh, into the administration, the average number of days from the beginning of a case until its conclusion was about 225. And the average number of days now is on the order of 150 to 160. The reason that, well, there are a few reasons this is important. One reason it's important is there's a speedy trial clock ticking when a, a case starts. Another reason it's important is in terms of accountability, there's a lot to be said for cases that resolve properly, but also resolve more quickly. It means that people who are responsible have to accept that responsibility closer in time to the action, and every study of deterrence indicates it's more driven by how soon and how certain the punishment is than the amount of punishment. So that's important. At a very practical level, what this is doing for the system is it is reducing the, uh, the pressure on the county, on county custody, meaning county custody's purpose in most situations is to hold people before trial. So if trial comes sooner, then they will either be off to state prison or they will get a sentence in the county or they will, you know, in many, many cases, in the majority of cases, go home on probation. And therefore, it's taking pressure off mass incarceration as well. It is also taking pressure off the courts themselves. And there was an announcement earlier this year by the FJD that they were closing seven criminal courtrooms. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, because some of these courtrooms don't run all day. They run for a portion of a day, but I do know this. It means that at least a couple of judges were switched from having a criminal docket to a civil docket. It means, therefore, the civil docket can move more quickly than it would have without benefit of uh, those judges. It certainly takes all kinds of pressure off sheriffs. When you go to court three times to conclude a case instead of five times, it takes pressure off of, uh, of sheriffs and off of the entire system. So we think as long as, these, as long as both sides are fully prepared and all the information is available and the proceeding is fair, we think this is a good thing. <clears throat> so so my, some of my questions are gonna focus around this issue. And I recently went to a, a Pew report where they said 86% of the Americans in the country agree that someone accused of a crime should have a trial within 30 days. I'm not, they were agreeing with that. I'm not saying that's feasible, okay, but they're agreeing with that. They also said that 82 to 85% of Americans actually, which you're on track with this, support less spending on jails and more on substance misuse or mental health or crime victim services. That's 82 to 85% of the population. And so the question I have for you on this particular item, what can we do, as a, uh, how do we work together to cut the 150 to 160 maybe down to 90 days? And is that feasible? Uh, I do think it's feasible if we can solve the biggest issue. And the biggest issue is uh, that in order for us to do our job of turning over all of the police paperwork, we have to have it at the beginning. And as we know, our police department works very hard. They have a ton of cases, they're overburdened, often they don't have the best technology available. And so there are occasions when we cannot get police discovery for a long time. And therefore, the, the clock for the defense to prepare doesn't really start running right away. Another very serious problem that we have in Philadelphia 
and it's not a problem that we had during almost all of my 30 years as an attorney, is that it's very difficult to get seizure analyses, meaning chemical testing of drugs. Fentanyl has posed certain challenges. The crime lab in Philadelphia, everyone concedes, does not have the ability to do all the testing. And when we have repeatedly asked that there be an outside vendor who would come in and, and do this testing, we haven't gotten anywhere. I mean, this has been a problem that's been going now for about 18 months. The only thing that mitigates that serious issue um, is, is that they are prioritizing. So in cases of selling drugs or possessing drugs with the intent to sell, they're prioritizing and they're doing those first. It often takes too long, but they're doing it first. The cases where we often never, I repeat, never receive a seizure analysis, which are thrown out as a result, are cases involving possession of drugs. So that mitigates a bit, but that can be, I mean, that is frankly a real flaw in the system. And then of course there are cases where for perfectly good reasons, we need to wait for a rape kit or we may need to accommodate the schedule of an expert on uh, you know, a particular type of physical injury to a child who cannot testify for him or herself. So there are occasions when that can delay things, but the single biggest impediment to our capacity to get these cases to trial quickly is our ability both technologically but also in terms of personnel to receive quickly all of the police paperwork from the police department. And I don't say that as a criticism of the police department. I just say that I'd love to be able to work together with the police department to expedite that. So let me go back to that for a second because I know that Councilman Tolberg talked about the costs. Up on State Road right now with the current budget and the current population, we're over $80,000 per person. And so if you can cut the amount of days down to 100 or 90, it'd be very worthwhile for, in many ways, getting people out quicker, getting back into society quicker. But also, if there's technology requirements that the police department or anyone else needs, is there someone who can do a report or a study that says, if we invest this amount of money, we can speed this to this level? And I think the savings and the help of getting people back into society would tenfold pay for this. So I'm just asking if that down the road is something you can maybe look at. Because Councilman, it's something we would love to look at. We have been blessed because from the beginning of our administration, we were approached by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is um, a pile of money that comes from Mr. Zuckerberg and his uh, partner, Ms. Chan, that is for the purpose of promoting social justice with data. And they gave us two fellows, and they are paying for these two fellows who are helping our data capacity. We're seeing a little bit of what's possible today, but we're hoping to do more. It seems to me that's an incredibly valid point. Why pay a fortune for unnecessary delays and continuances if a much smaller amount of money would expedite justice? It just doesn't make any sense. So I would be happy to see what we can do in our office to, uh, to see perhaps whether those fellows can assist or we can find academics who could come in and assist with that project. Okay, thank you. Should I come back to the next round? Yes, Councilman, but we do have uh, I know. two other I have two quick, can I ask my last two quick questions, I'll be done? Please. Okay. All right, thank you. 83% of Americans believe police should cite rather than arrest, which will cut down on our costs. Have we looked at the nonviolent crimes and see in every possible area if we can have citations versus the arresting on, on the nonviolent issues? You know, that is a fascinating suggestion. We, our policy team has not sat down with that issue specifically, but I'm happy to suggest okay. that we do that. It, it may require, as occurred um, with, the, with the assistance of many of the council people here, I think including Councilman Jones, it may require the passing by city council of some summary offenses or, or violations of city code that are analogs to criminal statutes so that a uh, so that a non-criminal ticket option exists and so that the police can act on that option. But um, I think for many offenses, that may be an excellent idea. Now, I know that uh, Public Defender Bradford Gray is going to testify shortly, and I hope someone will inquire of her a little bit about her pretrial model and some of the ideas she has about um, citations, both in this sense but in another sense, because I think she's onto something there. One last question. The New York Times reported, <clears throat> I think it was a year ago, that we're the opioid capital, specifically in Kensington of the, of the U.S., which was, for everyone in the city, a terrible story. What can we do to dramatically change that image and control what's going on and, 
and put more enforcement in place. And I know it's also federal and, and other agencies, but if, we, if you came to us and said, you know what, I need X amount of dollars to handle this situation, I think we should look at that. I can tell uh, there is no easy solution, obviously. You know, a big part of the problem is that the feds uh, loosened up the supply of pills in the last decade from X to 4X. And you have the first crisis, first drug crisis I'm aware of that has been dri driven by medical doctors passing opioids in pill form to trusting patients. So, I mean, really, one of the big solutions would be for the Fed to screw down on that supply back to where it was a decade ago before they were lied to and we were all lied to about Big Pharma claiming that these things were not addictive when we know they're atrociously addictive. Obviously, that doesn't, you know, that I'm not shirking responsibility. I'm just saying that's a small part of the problem. There are other aspects to it involving how it's distributed and how the reality is that the Fed has decided not to go after a lot of the inappropriate things going on with distributors who deliver mountains of pills to towns where only 14 people live. So that's an aspect of it. Within the city of Philadelphia, my options are limited, frankly. One of them is traditional law enforcement, and we have done some of that. But, you know, frankly, I'm just not willing to spend my time going after 15-year-olds who'll be replaced by the next 15-year-old the next day and end up with a criminal record. I am much more interested in going after bona fide drug organizations that have owned a block or been in that area for a period of time. Uh, in the case of Kip and Cambria, we had an organization 20 years old that was owned by the son of the person who owed, owned it 20 years ago, and we were able to uproot 67 real drug dealers and bring them to justice. That's a part of it. But I think we all recognize that the, the most important aspect of this is trying to deal with addiction. It is very difficult to walk around Kensington and Allegheny right now. I was there very recently with the commissioner, also with Councilwoman Quinona Sanchez, who has to deal with those issues. I understand how upset the neighbors are with what's going on. And we do have to come to some kind of a plan that doesn't simply repeat the mistakes of, of the past, which is taking people who are addicted to drugs and giving them long jail sentences. But we have to come to some method of getting them the treatment that they need, at least when they are ready for it, of allowing them to recover and to save their own lives, but also making things livable within that area. And I'm 100% open to having that conversation with as many stakeholders as want to have it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognize Councilman Taubman Berger. Mr. President, thank you very much. Um, injection sites, forced treatment, or incarceration or jail, in some ways, doesn't that save lives as well? So I understand your point, and, uh, and I know it comes from the same place we're all coming from, which is we just want to stop people from dying. Um, I can tell you this, though, it's complicated, because the statistics on what happens if you take someone who is addicted to opioids, you put them in jail for a week or a month or three months, the statistics on that show that the incidence of fatal overdose goes up about 1,000%. And it goes up about a thousand percent for a simple reason, which is that people relapse. It is the nature of addiction that people relapse. And the average person who recovers will actually undergo drug treatment about nine separate times. I, I would agree. In fact, there's a sign that says never stop trying to stop. Right. I mean, and that goes for a lot of uh, drug addictions from alcoholism to, to what we're, we're speaking to. Right. But, but also when you have forced treatment, I mean, you're kind of, it is probably not a, the, the greatest uh, choice, but it does force the issue. Well, the, I, you know, again, I'll just be very candid with you. The, the reason they're dying coming out of inpatient treatment or they're dying coming out of jail is that those individuals, and no, it doesn't describe everybody because probably some people respond well to forced treatment, but the reason they're dying is because their tolerance is gone. And when their tolerance is gone and they come back and they use an amount that is similar to what they used before they went in, it's toxic and they die. So we have, we have to address that issue. I, you know, one of the troubling things about this, and I think about it a lot and have studied it a lot is one size really doesn't fit all. There are people who can cold turkey their way to recovery. There are others who are going to require medically assisted treatment for the rest of their lives. There are others who will never recover no matter what. There probably are some lives that will be saved by being in custody for a period of time and, and being able to reflect and access other resources. And there are others who will die because they went into custody for a short period and their tolerance went away. Um, there really is not one size that fits all, and the people who have spent their careers on this and made this their life's work in places that pursue some fairly modern approaches like Vancouver and places like that, they will say that. So I, as much as I would like to tell you 
that I have an answer, I don't. I think there okay. is a different right. and individual answer for each person. And I do think that there are there's some science and statistics, not at my fingertips, but I think there's some science and statistics out there for what seems to work better for a larger number of people. So it's a, a very good point you raise. But I think the opposition that comes to safe injection sites is not about not saving lives. It's about the potential increase, and here I want your opinion, on uh, small crimes in communities that where these are located. I mean, when you go to a safe injection site, I believe you bring your own drug along, and they just kind of monitor you as you take it. I mean, they're not supplying the drug, or are they? So, um, you know, I have had the chance to actually visit supervised injection sites in Vancouver with a number of other prosecutors from around the country okay. on a little educational tour. And if the sites here are anything like the ones there, no, the site does not supply any drugs. No, the site does not inject any drugs. No, the site does not assist you in that injection. The one thing that they sometimes do at the better ones is they have a spectrometer which will test the drugs that you brought in there yourself. And it will tell you the dose of fentanyl is going to kill you, so you might want to split it up. Or it will tell you there's no fentanyl in here at all. It's heroin, so terrible as that is, it's not going to cause an overdose. Um, but no, they do not do those other things. I think, yeah, and just so we're all clear, the experience in Vancouver is not a, it's, it's not that it cured everybody of drug abuse. It sure. didn't. But the experience is they've had over a few million injections over 15 years. They have had hundreds of potentially fatal overdoses, and they have been able to save, so, save every one that occurred within that so facility. So the patient or drug user, depending on what terminology you want to use, is still responsible to bring their own drugs. And I think therein lies a very critical problem in the sense they have to buy this. And what happens uh, many times, and, and I'm seeing situations in many parts of the city where there are these small robberies. People get broke; their homes get broken into. They take their jewelry, they fence it at a uh, you know a pawn shop for the very purpose of getting money for drugs. So in that regard, nothing is being solved. You're just giving a safe place to do this. Y your point is is entirely valid. the The point is that there are two things that are causing someone who is addicted to drugs to do a robbery. One is drugs are really addictive. Two yes. is they cost a bunch of money. And they yes. cost a bunch of money partly because we have prohibition. What you do not see in Philadelphia anymore is people who are robbing each other to go buy a jug of wine. Because the jug of wine doesn't cost money. It happened during prohibition, but yes. it doesn't happen anymore. So, and I'm not saying this to be critical of the fact that we enforce laws against drugs, but the nature of enforcing laws against drugs as it drives up the price and for those who are addicted they are going to break into cars and they're going through windows and they're going to rob people in order to get their that money i will say this though there's nothing about the existence of a supervised injection site that's going to cause any of that because a supervised injection site is simply the place some of them will go to inject instead of doing it behind a dumpster or instead of doing it behind a car or doing it in a park i would rather see when a six-year-old is walking down the street in kensington I would rather see the person who is using drugs out of that child's view. I would rather see those dirty needles put into a sharps container inside of a supervised injection site. I would rather see the person injecting drugs get clean needles so as not to spread hepatitis C and HIV to other people, including our children's children. I would rather see all that, and it's not out of some sense that the most important people in the world are people addicted to drugs. They are no less or more important than anybody else. But think about those who have no involvement in drugs, who live in that neighborhood, and they have people injecting on their porches who could be injecting indoors somewhere. They have people leaving dirty ne needles on the sidewalk who could be leaving those needles indoors somewhere. They have people defecating outside who could be defecating in a bathroom in a supervised injection site. I went to a supervised injection site in Vancouver where what they had upstairs was detox. And, and okay. part of the whole process of building trust and, and talking to drug users and letting them think that their lives had value Okay, I, I, Let me just finish. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But part of that process is that there is a relationship of trust in which it becomes possible for that drug user to say, yes, I am ready for treatment. Yes, I'm ready to try detox again. I tried it four other times. It didn't work. I'm ready for that. So the notion that this is a bunch of drug fiends encouraging other drug fiends, and I know you're not saying anything like that, but the, that sort of a notion in many ways just comes out of the fact that we don't have facilities like this in the United States, and people don't understand how simple it is. 
let me also say this. I think a lot of people, a lot of people have this notion about what goes on in there. If you want to know what really goes on in there, it looks like a hair salon. A bunch of people come in, they inject their own drugs, and when they start to nod off, which is how you die from opioids, you have someone go over and nudge them, nudge their shoulder, and if that doesn't work, they'll rub their sternum to try to wake them up. If that doesn't work, they'll rub their shoulders, and if that doesn't work, they will go and they will get oxygen. And when they get oxygen and they give it to the person who is starting to succumb to the respiration suppression that comes from these drugs, that will almost always wake them up. But if it doesn't, the next thing they do is what our police department does all the time, which is they administer naloxone. And we want that. We want our librarians to do it because it saves lives. We want our police to do it because it saves lives. But this is simply something that's done indoors as opposed to what we have now, which is a lot of officers are undergoing second and third hand trauma. A lot of librarians are having to do things that frankly they shouldn't have to do because they're finding people in the bathrooms who have expired, who are dead. They're having to administer this on an emergent basis all the time. It's, these are to me nothing more than a little local emergency room where people can get saved from dying. They are nothing more than that. They're not gonna cure everything, but they do allow for the building of that relationship of trust and the separation of the harm that comes from this behavior on a neighborhood. So, you know, again, while I'm not involved with planning it, I don't really have any position other than it's not something that I would choose to prosecute. That's how I come to these positions. Well, just one real quick follow-up. Very valid points you have you have you have given here today. But while you were out in Vancouver, where this is done on on practice, did you actually ask the question that I have asked you, in the sense that is there increased crime right in the immediate area of these safe injection sites? It's a great question. I apologize for not answering it earlier. Uh, their studies say no. Okay. Now, and I can try to get that study for you. Obviously, you know, Canada is not identical to the United States. I'm not saying everything yes. is transferable. I can tell you this, though. I was, I was very impressed to see that a lot of law enforcement were very much in favor 15 years in of supervised injection sites, and they told me very directly why. They were tired of scooping up dead bodies. It was a rough job before this happened. They were tired of scooping up dead bodies on a daily basis. They were relieved to see that even though drug abuse did not go away, and there's plenty of drug abuse in Toronto, that they didn't have to endure that as a part of their job. And so they eventually came to support it for that reason. Mr. President and, 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 and Mr. President, I would like to see that study if, that is, if you can get that to I'll us. I'll be happy to do that for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, good afternoon, Mr. D.A. Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon, and Council team. President. Yeah, um, uh, we're, um, we've concluded our questions. We may call you back, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but at this point, I want to thank you so much for your, your, your testimony and your responses to the colleagues. Uh, thank so you, we're Council gonna, President. Thank you for yeah, your patience. Thank you. Good working with you. Um, we're going to take a break, and at that time, we will call Law Department, and let's see... 37 to like two, let's say 215, 230.